Welcome. Glad to see you all this morning. Just looking chill, just figuring out where's who's who and what's what. All right. This is how I get comfortable up here. I just have to take a minute. All right. Okay. Well, like I said, I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. If you're online joining us, we appreciate that too. And it's good to see you. Well, I can't see you, but it's good for you, us. Good for you to see us. All right. I'm going to pray, and then we have a few announcements, and we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day we have here today. <clears throat> we thank you for um, just the people that are here to worship and learn about you. We just want to ask for your blessing on the service. And uh, we just thank you for loving us. And uh, we pray this in your name. Amen. All right. First announcement I have is not me. It is Pete from Operation Christmas Child. He's going to come up and do an announcement. I'm going to go down. Good morning, church. Good morning. In the um, closing chapter of 28, Matthew's um, chapter 28, our Lord Jesus um, said in verse 16, All power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey the things I've commanded you. And, lo, I'll be with you always even to the end of the age. It is an absolute privilege and honor to be here with you today because this church, for 15 years, 15 years, has been fulfilling the Great Commission through Operation Christmas Child. This is the second time in my career as regional area coordinator for the state of Maine that I've been honored and privileged to um, give this award. And um, as I was just sharing with this young man over here, um, the first one I gave, that church has actually closed. And so Grace Community is the longest running drop off in the state of Maine as we speak today. Tens of thousands of children, that's what I just said, tens of thousands of children have heard the gospel message of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ through shoeboxes that have filtered through this facility tens of thousands. And um, again, I, um, 
I am just so honored and privileged to be serving with you guys. Pastor Jeremy, would you be so kind to come up here and accept this award? got to put my eyes on sorry this is just so beautiful um, but this is on behalf of Samaritan's Purse I'm I'm presenting it to you but understand and we both understand there's a number of um, people that have served um, to make this happen um, I'm looking over at one sitting all by herself over there <laughs> from the early days um, to Cheryl, who could not be with us today, who's um, um, serving in a different capacity or family, but I ask that you would accept this. But on behalf of Samaritan's Purse, um, this is presented in appreciation for your partnership with Operation Christmas Child. Um, and this is um, Franklin's verse right here with regards to the ministry. Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And that's from Mark chapter 9, verse 37. But this is the epitome of what it's all about right here. And so, sir, congratulations, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this with Absolutely. you guys. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, that's exciting, right? Amen. And like they said, it would be awesome if Cheryl was here to accept it. Um, we, we, can, we all kind of know how much of a driving force Cheryl is with Operation Christmas Child. Um, so, yeah. And I think we can mention, too, if you're wondering where Cheryl is, um, Cheryl's brother is not doing well. Um, he's been sick for quite a while, and the doctors have um, given him a, a couple weeks um, to live, but if you've talked to Cheryl about her brother, she's probably told you to pray for his salvation um, relentlessly, as she does, and I think it's worth mentioning that he has accepted Christ as his Savior, um, which is huge for Cheryl, so um, yes, so keep them in your prayers, and uh, as we grow, go into the season of Operation Christmas Child, keep that all in your prayers too, and um, if you can help out in any way, we have forms for drop-off and pick-up and um, a lot of ways to serve if you're interested in that. So uh, keep your ears open for more details coming of that. All right, next announcement. Bulletins again. I said this last week, and they're still here. They'll continue to be here. Um, bulletins are out again, front and back entrances. Lots of information you need in there. Um, so take that on your way in, your way out. And... If you're a nursery, it's a handy-dandy little chart in the back to tell you when you're there. So, uh, In the bulletin, too, there's a discipleship questionnaire. It's this piece of, piece of paper. I just changed <laughs> cultures here a little bit. Piece of paper um, that we want you to fill out to tell us um, where you think uh, your discipleship needs are and what we can do to serve you better for, as a church and as leadership. So that's right there. Last announcement, there's a business meeting on October 30th, directly after the service. Um, there's an agenda posted on the doors for that. You can read that yourself, but it's proposed changes adding the position of music director to our worship team, um, or to our leadership of the church. And uh, that is, again, October 30th. Should be a short meeting. That's the goal there. And then I'll enjoy. I said that's the last, meet last um, announcement, but it's not. There's one more. If you're interested in playing soccer and you're a child, um, I had to verify this because at first it was just, no, it's soccer, basketball. Soccer's ending. That's what he said. When you add too many details, it gets confusing. Like, you know. <laughs> so basketball is starting. If you want to play basketball and you're grades 4 to 12, if you're over that, I'm sorry. You can't do it. Um, there are sign-up sheets upstairs for that um, as part of the school. Uh, it's Grace Christian Academy. So if you know somebody that age that wants to play basketball, Sign them up. Home, home, home. Yes, you can be homeschooled or you can go here to school. Either one. Sound good? Okay, awesome. Scripture reading is in Romans chapter 11. 
starting in verse 11. And just a reminder, as we're turning there, that um, for giving, if you are worshiping in that way, we have a box over there for your gift, or you can do it online. Just log on, hit send. It's super easy. Um, that is definitely a part of worship that we um, encourage here, so that's there for that. Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 11. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they may, might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you, Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word, and we'll continue to worship him with our singing. Good morning, everyone. I see Dean's already standing. That's good. That's what we all want to be doing. Let's make a joyful noise. One.
So uh, I had the privilege of going yesterday to uh, a wedding, and uh, it was exciting. And um, I, I've been thinking about weddings since yesterday. And I want to read for you Ephesians or it's chapter 5, verses 31 through 32. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And that's a quotation of Genesis. But Paul continues, he says, This mystery is profound, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. See, marriage as God has created it is a picture of the gospel. And, and what's specifically about it is that Christ loves his church, that he gives himself up for her. Christ seeks to sanctify her both through his actions and through his word. And he so earnestly seeks to continue to provide gifts to his church to continue to make her more and more beautiful in his sight and in others. Ephesians chapter 5, 26 and 27 says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Christ has begun a work in those of you who this morning are professing his name. And he will bring it to completion. That's what he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And he says, what he started, he will finish. And so this morning, I, in thinking about marriage and thinking about Jarius and Ruth, I wanted to pray for the marriages of our Christian community, of this community here in Grace Community Chapel, that we might reflect in the marriages in this assembly, Christ and his church. So join with me and pray for that. Father God, I pray this morning, uh, Father, for the wonderful gift that you have given us in marriage. And Father, I, I thank you for it. And Father, I thank you that more so than just uh, the union between a man and a woman, that you've demonstrated that this is an image of Christ and his church. Father, I pray that uh, those of us in this assembly this morning who uh, are married would live up to the calling that you have called us, that we, and through our marriage, we would demonstrate uh, the actions of Christ and his church. Father, I pray that our marriages would be solely founded upon you and upon what your son has completed at the cross. And Father, I pray that as we continue to work out in our marriages love and submission to one another, Father, that you would, you would demonstrate uh, your son through our actions. And Father, that we'd be more and more conformed to the image of him. I pray that would be true in the assembly this morning. And I pray for those who aren't married, Father. I pray that they would continue to spurn us as they see us and look at us and say, hey, you know, your marriage needs to reflect the church. And God, that we might not take offense to that, but we would recognize that they're spurning us towards that. And so, Father, I pray that you would just be with the marriages in our church. Pray that you would knit the couples closer together. And Father, I pray that you would be the Lord and Savior of every marriage in our church. Father, we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue, as we have asked the Lord to do, let's continue. Join with us in worshiping Christ and through his actions alone who has set us into this hope this victory, this freedom, and this coming eternal peace. Strange and divine, I can see all his 
by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. three-pager, so <laughs> barely fits in here, but it's all good words based on scripture. Mm -hmm. Christ our hope in life and death, and in the chorus you'll hear that after you sing hallelujah, you, you sing our hope springs eternal, which really is the assurance of eternal salvation through Christ our Lord. One.
Well, you've heard it preached via the song. Christ is our only hope in life and death. Amen. Amen. We could stop there. We won't. So I have a confession to make this morning. I'm preaching a pre-prepared sermon by somebody else. And everyone here is like, oh! Before you start freaking out, the sermon's from the Apostle Paul. And it's in Acts chapter 13. And that's where we're going to be this morning. But it is kind of nice when, you know, in Scripture they record a sermon. Because honestly, in preparation for that sermon, you're like, there's my four points. The Apostle Paul made them. I guess I just copy him. And then I'm being faithful to the scriptures, and at the same time, I don't have to do the work. It's way easy. For those of you that know me fairly well, you know that I probably spent more time than necessary diving into all the little nuances, of which you will see very little. But that's okay. Because I'm going to share with you what I think is most important. So we're in Acts chapter 13, and if you're, if you're just with us this week, or you've missed a couple of weeks, and you might not know kind of where we're at in the, in the specific story, so um, the Apostle Paul, who's been pulled back to Antioch for a period of time, taught the, the city of Antioch, and that's Antioch in Syria, that's going to become important in a little bit, and uh, so he's there with Barnabas, and they're teaching the church, and the church is just growing, and it's growing by leaps and bounds, and it's there they're first called Christians, and we talked about that. And from there, they go back to Jerusalem because they, they hear there's going to be a famine in Jerusalem and they, they provide some finances to Jerusalem. And then there's some events that takes place in Jerusalem. Peter uh, is captured. James had just recently been killed. And Peter is miraculously let go. And we see the events of there. And then Herod uh, Agrippa is killed by uh, the hands of God because of blaspheme. And then we get into chapter 13 and we start this kind of unique thing where the church of Antioch is just continuing to grow, and finally they're like, hey, we've, we've reached our community, it's time to send missionaries. And we see the first time missionaries being sent outside of the community that they're working in. And so this isn't uh, non-deliberate like the rest of them, where Stephen was murdered and they were dispersed. This time they're actually, no, we're going to go. Uh, and so they send specifically Paul and Barnabas to the island of Cyprus. And so Paul and Barnabas, they go over to Cyprus, and they preach through all of Cyprus, and we saw that last week. Um, and they're getting ready to leave Cyprus, and that's where we're picking up the story in Acts chapter 13, and we're starting in verse 13. So 13, 13 makes it real nice and easy, okay? And that's where we're going to be starting off this morning. So Paul and his companions, this is verse 13, reading out of the ESV. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Poseidon. Okay, we're going to stop there for a second. Okay, so a couple things that are noting. Uh, notice how it doesn't say Barnabas and Saul. Notice how it says Paul and his companions. There's a significant change here. One, we're no longer using Saul's Jewish name. We're using Paul, his Roman name. It's a transition. And before, in every text before this, it was always Barnabas and Saul. And now it's Paul and his companions. And there's, a, there's a slight importance in the Greek here that, that is actually valuable. Sometimes people are like, hey, Greek word, and you're like, so it means the same thing in English. Like, you know, but this one's important because there's a transition here where Paul is now named first because he's in charge. And there's a transition of leadership where Barnabas was kind of in charge before, and now Paul is coming in, and he's stepping up, and he's kind of taking the role that God has given him as an apostle. And he's taking that charge. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't know if you've ever experienced this at maybe a job or a place where all of a sudden you've been put over authority over somebody else, and that's hard. Or maybe you've been the person that has had somebody else put an authority over you who was a peer. And that can be kind of a hard experience. And I think about Barnabas, right, and the kind of guy he is, the son of encouragement, We've been we've talking about Barnabas for quite a while in Acts. Uh, and, and I think Barnabas took this really well. But it says in verse 13, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, Luke kind of throws that in, and, and if you just pass over, you might not notice anything there. But this is John Mark, Barnabas' cousin. 
the one who left with them. And it says that he goes back to Jerusalem. And it doesn't give us a whole lot of details in the text, so we can't speculate. But by the time we come to Acts chapter 15, at the end of Acts, Paul and Barnabas are gotten ready to go out on another missionary journey, and they get into a big debate. And we're going to talk about this when we get there. But the debate is whether or not to take John Mark with them. And Paul's like, no, no, we're not taking John Mark with us. And Barnabas is like, no, no, we've got to take him with us. And they split over it. Now, it's possible that John Mark left and forsook the missionary journey that they were all planning on taking together. And if that's the case, Barnabas might have been giving him mercy and saying, no, he's my cousin, we can, we can make, he can try again. Let's give, him, let's give him another shot. And Paul's saying, no, he's a liability. So this, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. There's a lot packed into that. There's a lot packed into that. But whatever the circumstances are, however it came to be, whether it's because of hardship or whether it's because of a disagreement, whether it's because John didn't like the fact that Paul was taking leadership over Barnabas, that could have been it as well. Whatever those circumstances are, he just notes that he leaves. And we're not going to speculate anymore, but what happens next is they go to, um, from Paphos, which is on Cyprus, and they came to Perga, which is in Pamphylia, which this is, we're starting to get into Galatia which is what the letter of Galatians is written to, is a church is all in Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey. So they go there, and in verse 14, but they went from Perga and came to Antioch. Now, if you notice, it says they went from Pamphos, came to Perga, and then they went from Perga, and then right, right to Antioch. We get no story about what happened in Perga. Nothing. No story. Luke doesn't see fit to tell us anything that happened. We assume they went in and preached the word because later on in Acts 14 it says they delivered the word and then they went to Antioch. That's it. That's all we get. Keep in mind, Luke doesn't give us all the details. So they go to Antioch and Pisidia and it says, verse 14, let's keep reading. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Verse 15. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have a word of encouragement for the people, say it. Pause again. So this is interesting. Uh, there's a lot of pieces here about Jewish custom that you can pick up from this text. One of the things is, you notice, so they go into Antioch. What's the first thing they do? On the Sabbath, they go to the synagogue. That's the place where God is worshipped, right? If you're going to worship the one true God, you would have been a Jew or you would have been a proselyte Gentile who would have went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. That's what you would have done. And so Paul goes with them, and they sit in. It says he sat down. So he sits down. I don't know if he sits in the back of the room. I don't know if he's like you know, one of those visitors that comes in and sits in the back. Where you're like, okay, I'm just going to kind of scope out what the situation is. I don't know how that works. Uh, but it says that they sat down. And verse 15 tells us that after the reading from the Law and the Prophets. Now, this was the pattern in the synagogue. So if you attended synagogue in the first century, the first thing they would do is they would get up, they would pull one of the scrolls out, and they would have a reading from the law. Sometimes they would read the entire law. For those of us who you know, are not able to have a long attention span, that would have been difficult. Uh, but, but that's what they did. Uh, and then they did a reading from the prophets. And so they would spend time reading portion of the law, and they would do a reading from the prophets. And then they would sit back down, and then they would invite people, the elders of the synagogue would invite people to come up and to extort the word of God either from what was writ, read that day or something else. Now, you're an elder in a synagogue in Antioch of, of Poseidon, which is Galatia, Turkey, and Paul showed up. He studied under Gamaliel. He's a pretty big deal. And they've come from afar, and they say they have a word. So what are you going to do? You're going to invite them to speak, which is exactly what we see happen as we continue on. So verse 16 starts... The sermon. And this is Paul's longest sermon in Acts. And uh, this entire sermon can be read in less than five minutes. And for those of you who are now asking the question of how can Paul do an entire sermon in five minutes, but it takes Jeremy 30, um, <laughs> here's the answer to that. Okay, here's the answer to that. Um, this isn't the entire sermon. Uh, Luke is kind of giving us a summary. He's saying, Here, here's the summary of Paul's sermon. Okay? I think Paul spoke a lot more than just this brief little five-minute section. Okay? 
Um, I think that consistently throughout Luke and Acts, he is not writing all of the entire sermons out. Uh, I, I think he's kind of giving us a snippet of the most important sections to kind of pay attention to. So, so if you're here this morning going saying, hey, you're just about done, five minutes, you're all set, uh, get to the point and go. Uh, sorry, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to do, do full-length sermons, no, no summaries here. But let's take a look at the scripture this morning. Let's, we're going to read through the sermon. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to read through, there are four things Paul primarily addresses um, and we're going to look through those four things. Uh, the first thing uh, is going to be 17 through 22, which is what we're going to read first. Um, so verse 16 says, So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out. In about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as inheritance. All of this took about 450 years, and after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. Let's pause there. So the first point that Paul makes is that God chose the people of Israel. And, and this is important to those who are present in their hearing. He's kind of coming alongside of them and, and agreeing with them. These are people of Israel. Now, if you notice, though, in verse 15, I'm sorry, in verse 16, uh, he says, men of Israel and you who fear God. Why wouldn't he just say men of Israel? If it was just brothers of Israel, then he wouldn't have needed to have the and, and you who fear God. These are two separate groups of people. And we've been talking a lot about this in Acts, is how there is the Israelites, those who were born under the covenant of promise, and there's everybody else. And the everybody else in this particular context are Gentiles who fear God, kind of like Cornelius. They fear God. They're not technically part of Israel. They've not come into the covenant family. They're excluded to a certain extent. But they're coming to the synagogue to hear the word of God because they fear the one true God. So they fear God and he says, listen to, listen to me, listen to the things I have to say. And then he says, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers. He, he's giving them that, that like, yeah, yeah, each, God chose us. We're great. We're awesome. He chose us. Uh, but, you know, before you get too terribly long in verse 18, uh, he's, he's doing a whole story of Israel. And verse 18 kind of hit me. I don't know if it hit you when I read it. But it says, for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. He put up with them. It, that, that's a very interesting summary, right? Like, God put up with Israel in the wilderness. I hope God doesn't put up with me. <laughs> I hope that wouldn't be how we would define that. Um, but I think it's a fair, I've been, we've been reading through Joshua, and we've been reading through Judges uh, in our daily moment in the Word during the week. And um, God put up with a lot with the people of Israel. He put up with a lot. And uh, I, I think about that as Paul's kind of talking about how God chose this people um, there's this element where he puts and he put up with them. Um, why did he do that? Well, ultimately, he put up with them for a reason. And as he continues on, he talks about the destroying of the seven nations. That's, that's what we see specifically in the time of Joshua, verse 19, giving them the land as inheritance. We see that through judges and into the kings. He says all of this took about 450 years. That's a long time. That's actually longer than we've been a country. It's a long time. And he says, after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. And they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish. And if you remember Saul, he was like, if you were going to picture a king, he was a king. Like, he was, he was physically fit. He was attractive. He was smart. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. When you looked at him, he's like, yeah, that's a king. And yet, 
it ended up being the case that God would eventually reject Saul in his kingship. And that's what Paul, or Paul says in verse 22. He says, and when he had removed him, because Saul didn't obey the Lord. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all of my will. Now, the people of Israel at this point are excited, right? Paul's preaching in the synagogue, and they're excited. They're like, yeah, David, King David. They're looking for a Messiah who's following after like David. And they're like, yeah, 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 I know where you're going, Paul. You're going to talk about Messiah, right? We're going to start talking about maybe some scripture verses that deal with Messiah, Paul. Yeah, yeah, we're awaiting the king. Get rid of the Romans. Go back to the land of Israel. Because remember, these are Jews, part of the dispersion. So then we get to Paul's second point. So his first point, God chose the people of Israel. His second point, the Savior descended from David is announced. Verse 23. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus as he had promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And John was finishing his course. He said, Why, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, the one after me is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Now, I find it very interesting that Paul brings up John. And he doesn't say John the Baptist living in this particular land. He did this sort of thing. Now, maybe Luke is just summarizing and Paul did provide all those details. But the assumption of everyone in Luke's day is that everybody knows who John the Baptist is. His ministry was widespread. In fact, there's going to become a point in time in Acts where we get to a group of people who've been baptized by the baptism of John. And they're way out there. John's ministry was massive. And yet, he sat in the wilderness, ate locusts, and honey. Like he, he, wasn't, he wasn't like a world traveler, okay? But his ministry was impactful because he was foretelling the coming of the Messiah. Paul announces that the fact that the Messiah has come, it is that Savior of Israel, Jesus, as he promised. As he promised, tying him to David. And before he has come, John makes some statements about him. So he takes John's authority, which maybe many of them were like, yeah, John, he's a, he's a pretty significantly good guy. And he's saying, let's take his authority. And what did John say about this Jesus? John says, who do you suppose that I am? John says, I'm not he. Not ego I me. I am not he. I am not him. John is not the Messiah. And they were wondering that. They thought maybe he was. But instead he says, I'm the voice in the wilderness preparing the way of the Lord. But what does John say? He says, no, behold, after me one is coming whose sandals of whose feet, whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Now, if you know anything about first century, there was a lot of rabbis in first century. There's a lot of Messiah figures. And there was a lot of rabbis that were going around teaching lots of people. And one of the things that became a rule among the Jewish people and kind of a custom is that you couldn't abuse your power as a rabbi. And one of the ways that you could not abuse your power is you could not force somebody to unlace your sandals because it was pretty dirty. It was a bad job, okay? They didn't have sneakers, and they walked around all day in a very dusty climate, and their feet were really dirty. And you couldn't force somebody to take your sandals off and untie them. You could force them to do a lot of things as a rabbi in the first century, but that was one thing you weren't allowed to do. So what does John, this great minister, say? The sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. He's like, the thing that we prevent people from doing because it's so horrible, I'm not worthy of doing that. What did he think about Jesus? So Paul communicates that to him. The Savior has that has descended from David, he is been here. Verse 26. 
he starts the third point of his message, which is the promises are now fulfilled in Christ. Starting in verse 26, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God. Notice again the two. To us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him up from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news of what God promised to the fathers. This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. And we're going to pause there. You see how he's tied everything. He probably gave a massive sermon on like, hey, everything that happened in Israel. Reminding them of their history, which is what Israel always did. Reminding themselves of their history. And then he reminded them of the promises of the coming Messiah. And then he said, Jesus is that Messiah. He fulfills the promises of old. The early confession of the church is four things. Jesus was crucified. He was buried in the tomb. God raised him from the dead, and he was seen by many witnesses. All four things of those are in this account. Oftentimes when Paul's sharing the gospel, those are the four things he brings people's attention to. He does so here. He condemns the Jewish leaders in verse 27. He says, They did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets. What is he telling them? But if you do, you'll see him as the Messiah. He's come a long way. This is, this is a long distance. Even from Antioch. Right? This is the long distance. This is almost to the northern end of Turkey from Syria. Two different Antiochs. Now, why is there two different Antiochs? Some people are like, wait, 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 there's two Antiochs? There was this guy named Antiochus, and he would go around, and he'd plant cities, and he'd name them after himself, okay? He's a little egotistical, right? He'd go to every single land, and he'd find some place, and he'd be like, well, we're going to call this place Antioch after me. Um, So uh, that's why there's so many Antiochs. uh, But Paul traveled all this way, and he said, we've come this far Verse 32, to bring you the good news that what God has promised to the fathers, he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. He's like, all of it's fulfilled in Jesus. Stop looking for anything else. There's nothing else to look for. It's all in him. But you shouldn't just take Paul at his word, right? There's tons of people claiming to be the Messiah in this time period. Why is Paul right? Well, he's already declared that we've witnessed him coming back from the dead. That's pretty significant. But he's going to defend this also from the scriptures. So this isn't his point, but verse 33 down to verse 37, he defends Jesus as the Messiah. And he uses scripture. Because he sees scripture as authoritative. He sees scripture as what we should use to define what we believe. And so that's what he's going to do starting in verse 33. So continuing in that verse, he says, This he has fulfilled uh, to us, their children, by raising Jesus as it is written in the second psalm. Psalm chapter 2. He quotes, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And for this fact, he raised him from the dead, no more returning to corruption. He has spoken this way, I will give to you a holy and sure blessing of David. Therefore, he says in another psalm, You will not let your holy ones see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep and was laid with the fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. So Paul gives four verses to defend his point. Now, Luke is summing this up. And I think it's really hard for us because we're like, that's all he used? Like, that's it? Like, just these snippets of these little... And that's why I think, again, it's a summary. I think he goes into a lengthy description of those verses, talks about how those are applying directly to the Messiah, and we could do that this morning, and there would be a lot of time we would spend 
specifically showing you how those prophecies directly relate to Jesus. But that's what Paul probably did. He probably spoke for quite some time. Proving his point that that which was originally prophesied is not of David. He uses David, the one he's kind of keyed off of. David writes in Psalm 2, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Who's, who's David talking about? Well, he's talking, God talking to him. But it doesn't really seem like in the text of Psalm 2 that David's being referred to. It's almost this, this indication there's something greater than what David's being referred to. Paul brings that out. He also brings it out where David says, I will give to you the sure and holy blessings of David. This is referring to the children of Israel and Isaiah. Well, what's being referenced here? This, this son, of this Messiah that's coming. And then David says in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. Then he goes on to, to prove a point. David's dead, and he stinketh, according to the King James. Okay? He, he's, he's well gone at this point. He's brittle, probably dust, maybe some bones. Right? He's not, he's not around. So he saw corruption. So how is it that David would say that he wouldn't see corruption? Well, he wasn't referring to himself. And that there would be a descendant on his throne at some point who would die and would not see corruption, and that's Jesus. And that's what Paul proved. Because God raised Jesus up, verse 37. So, he defends the gospel, he defends Christ from the scriptures, and then point four, his last point, he gives the call of the gospel. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said of the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, and be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells you. Now, Breaking this down a little bit, I think is interesting. And I want to spend a little time here this morning. Paul looks to them and says, this is the avenue of the forgiveness of sins. Now, Jewish people did not technically have forgiveness from sins. They had atonement from their sins. That the blood of, of the animals would cover their sins and atone for the work, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't fully satisfy the demands but they were looking forward to a promised redeemer, one who would fully atone for their sins. And we know ultimately that this law that they had been given, which they were not very good at obeying, if you read your Old Testament, was more of a burden to them than a help. Because by the law they knew sin and then sinned. Let's turn over, put your hand here for just a second, and we're going to turn over to Romans chapter 3. I find it interesting, I'll, I'll quote to you a, a passage of scripture in Galatians, but we're going to go to Romans 3. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 16, and reminding these people of what Paul is teaching here, he says, yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but instead through faith in Jesus so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one's justified. This is the idea that's consistently being hit throughout the scriptures. And turning over to Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 19. We could read the whole chapter, but we won't do that this morning. Chapter 3, verse 19. Paul starts here and he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What is this saying? All right, it means when you're driving, I've used this before, you're driving down the road, and you don't know the speed limit, and you're driving whatever feels right, and then all of a sudden you see the speed limit sign, and you go, well, I'm comfortable. Going over is okay. It wasn't sin until you knew it was wrong. And then it was sin.
what Paul's saying is, is that the law shows up so that every one of you might say, I can't do it. I broke it. In fact, once we know the law, our heart can, can, kind of goes, well, it's not wrong. I can do what I want. Paul says, I didn't know what coveting was until I knew the law said don't covet, and then I knew what it was. And I knew what it was to covet, and I knew what it was to want something that wasn't mine. I like how in verse 19 it says, so that every mouth may be stopped. No person is going to stand before God and say, yeah, I did it all right. No person. But sometimes I think in the Christian experience, we pretend like verse 20 isn't true. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. There is nothing you can do to make God like you more or do what you want him to do. Uh, There's nothing you can do to please God. Like, well, if I just do the right thing, then he'll be happy with me. That's not a thing. We can't seek our justification by our own behavior. If we do, you're just going to end up condemned. Because by no working of the law, and look, that's what, that's what they believe out there. That's what they believe we teach. They believe that we're like, hey, fix your life, and then come to Jesus, and then maybe he might accept you. Right? That's, I mean, you hear that all the time. That's what they think we believe. Don't confuse them. Don't try to make them be what they can't be. Bring them to Christ. He is the satisfaction of the law. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. What is he talking about? Look, you can see the righteousness of God in the law. There is a righteousness and a purity and a a moral purity in the law. And if you wanted to see what righteousness looked like, you had to look at the law and go, wow, that's right, and I'm not. But now righteousness is seen outside of it because Christ fulfilled it. He did it. And you can look to him and go, that's what righteousness looks like. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, there is no distinction. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. And they are justified by his grace as a gift through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That we are not redeemed by our works of the law. We are redeemed by Christ and by Christ alone. If you get this, don't stop getting it. I, I think sometimes we talk about, well, you know, I've heard the gospel. I've got it down. I don't, I don't need to hear it anymore. No, you need to hear it every day. And Paul is ultimately saying that God had passed over former sins. He continues to talk about that. And then as he goes on, verse 37, or 27, sorry, there's no 37. For those of you who are like, wait, there's no 37. 27. Paul then goes on and he says, then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. You are justified. You are made right. You are, it's just as if you never sinned. Not because you haven't, but because that's how God is treating you. He doesn't deal with us in accordance with our sins. Now, verse 31 would be an important point to remind you, do not then, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? And And Paul says, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. This doesn't mean that you can go and do whatever you want to do and now there's no moral law. You know, free, free for all. Because my sin's paid for, I can go do whatever I want. That's not what Paul says. He says, no, actually, now we uphold the law, but we don't uphold it as a burden trying to get our salvation. We know that we have our salvation and now we uphold the law to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Go back to Acts. I think... Probably, Paul spent a lot more time than what we see in this little section detailing all of that. So how do they respond? How do they respond? But first, actually, before we talk about how they responded, 
What was the last thing Paul said? He gives him the gospel, and then what does he say? Verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest what is said as the prophets should come about. Paul says, beware, just in case those prophecies that were made, they actually come true. Oh, by the way, they usually do. Um, and he quotes Isaiah, and he says, Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work you will not believe even if one tells it to you. Paul says, don't fulfill the words of the prophet. Believe what's being told. It's being told to you. Don't reject it. So verse 42. And they went out, and the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. That's a great response. Come back. Talk to us again. Verse 43. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, whom, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So we see people breaking for the Sabbath, and they're like, okay, going back to their homes. But there's tons of people who are like, no, we want to hear more. We want to hear more about this Jesus and about how he's fulfilled the law and how we don't have to fulfill the law in our flesh anymore, that we can rely upon him and put our faith in him. So they follow after him. They're excited. And then there's a whole week that happens between verse 43 and 44. And it says, verse 44, the next Sabbath. Look what it says. Almost the entire city, the whole city, gathered to hear the word of the Lord. That's a pretty, that's a pretty big deal. The whole city shows up at the, at the synagogue. And as you can imagine, the religious leaders, they're just absolutely ecstatic. Because everyone here is here to, to hear the word of Yahweh. No. Verse 45. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him which should have been for their justification, their salvation, and their excitement that the Messiah has come. Now they're rejecting it because, wait, Gentiles are showing up too. That's not okay. And Paul's getting an awful lot of attention about this Jesus thing, and we're kind of losing influence. We're going to contrary this. And, and guys, sometimes religious leaders, they do that. God starts working and doing something, and then they're like, they shut it down. And that's wrong. It's, if it's of God, we should not be shutting it down. So we have the religious leader's response. In verse 20, 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. And I, and I wonder if there's right before this, they're, like, they're talking to each other like, yep, we knew this was going to happen. I think this is a pattern. I think this continues to happen. Verse, they speak out boldly, 46, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first unto you. But since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. Verse 47, For the Lord commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. He says, look, Jews, you were always about bringing the rest of the world to Yahweh through you. And now... You're forsaking your role. Now that the Gentiles are coming, you're like, no, 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 no. Just about us. National promises. Keep them out. And Paul says, it was necessary that the word of God came to you because you are the chosen people of God, but we'll go somewhere else. We'll go to those who will hear and who will believe. Thrust it aside. Judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. I hope that there's no one here this morning that would thrust aside the gospel and would judge themselves unworthy of receiving eternal life. But verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Gentiles are excited. They're being grafted in. We read that verse earlier today. They're being included in. They're now part of the gospel. This is part of what Acts is all about. We've been seeing that progression since Cornelius. I would be amiss to not point out where it says, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. I spent a lot of time studying that text. And I'm going to leave you with this. What this text is saying is that those who believed were among the qualified, what qualified them was that they were appointed to eternal life. That's what it says. 
You can change the word appointed to ordained. It could also mean that. Either way, it's something outside of themselves. People respond to the gospel because the word of God never returns to him void. It accomplishes what he intends it to accomplish. The Gentile nations, they respond, and as many as were appointed to eternal life, they believed. Verse 49, the word of God was spreading, where the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. It's just turning the whole region upside down. All of Galatia, all of what's Turkey, it's just turned upside down. This is exciting news. Gentiles are grafted in. They get to approach. There's always been this dividing wall. They can approach. Verse 50. But the Jews incited devout women of high standing in the leading men of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. The Jews are so anti the gospel at this stage that they're working with the Roman officials to drive out Paul and, these, and, and Barnabas. They want him out. No more of this Jesus talk. We are rejecting the Messiah. This is continually showing the hardening of Israel. That Israel's being hardened so that the Gentiles might receive Christ. So that everyone might be able to come. That's what we see in Romans chapter 11. We read that earlier. Verse 51, what's their response? But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. There's a, a consistent judgment. Jesus actually tells his disciples when he sends them out, he says, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and go. go. And woe to those cities who don't receive you. Woe to these people who had the word of God These aren't Gentiles who didn't have the word of God. These are Jewish people who had the word of God. They heard it and they willfully rejected it. And they said, no, because I don't like how that ends up. That doesn't fit with my system. Never reject the word of God for your tradition. So Paul and Barnabas, they shook the dust off their feet against them. That is a a judgment against them. And they go to Iconium. In verse 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That's referring to those who were left. There is a joy and, and, and just a spirit among the people that are left. God has saved us. He has brought us out by faith. We are no longer bound by the law, but instead we're free through Christ. And we're free to obey the law because the law has now been written on our hearts. And there's an excitement. And Paul and Barnabas changed this Galatia forever. What's incredible is we don't know exactly how all of it came about, but by the fourth century, this synagogue is gone, and there's a massive church built on top of it. And that's kind of cool. So, we've been talking about Acts. And what we've been doing is we've been talking about, okay, so what does it mean for us, right? What's the application? How does this apply to life in the church? So here are the things that I think that this passage tells us about life in the church. One, know that Jesus has been the plan and is the fulfillment of the scriptures. Don't reject the Old Testament scriptures. They are also Christian scriptures. Jesus has been the plan all along. You can see him from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, all the way to the very end of the book of Revelation. Understand that Jesus came to fulfill the law. Stop trying to fulfill the law on your own. Stop trying to do the law on your own. Stop setting yourself up and going, well, if I just obey, then God will accept me. God's acceptance of you is not on the basis of your, or ability of your, of your obedience. Now that doesn't diminish the fact that 1 Peter says, and this is Christians, be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. And Peter reminds them of that and reminds them to keep their conduct pure among the Gentiles, among the nations. But we don't do that as the basis of our salvation. 
And if you're sitting there wrestling with your salvation, going, well, man, sometimes I sin and maybe I'm not saved. You're, if your basis of salvation is because of whether or not you've done the law right, and whether or not you're obedient, whether or not you're not sinning, you've got it wrong. And you could be sitting here this morning because this is the right thing to do to come to church. And because this is kind of like a, a church law, right? Like you got to come to church. That's what you got to do. And then somehow you're, you're doing the right thing and you're saved. And that's not it at all. If you don't have faith in Jesus, there is no salvation no matter what you do. We seek to obey the moral law, not that God owes us anything, not that we have something to stand on before the throne of God, but we obey because it's our response to the justification that has already occurred on our behalf. The last thing, the last thing I learned from this passage is that we are to declare the word of God. And when it's possible, start from a commonplace. You know, I, I was talking with John. You know, one of the things that John Wyman likes to do is he starts with, with you know, we're, we're all bikers, right? And, and you know, so you start with something you're, that you're, you're able to work with them on, some, someplace where you're common, and work from there. But deliver the word of God. Deliver the truth of God. And deliver the scriptures. Keep that up. That's going to be a consistent theme throughout. You're like, well, that's the application every week. Yes, it is. <laughs> Guess what? That's our purpose. That's why we're here. However, when people reject you, remember that they're rejecting the message of the cross, and it's predicted. And it's predicted. Paul didn't get all up in arms when they rejected him. He didn't be like, oh, well, you know, you really got to believe me. No. He, okay. This was predicted. And remember that as many as the Lord calls will receive the message. Your job is to deliver the message. God's the one that's doing the saving, not you. You deliver the message. But make sure their rejection of you is a rejection of the word and not a rejection of your behavior. Because I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, sometimes I see some gospel presentations that I would be upset by. Because not that, they're, not that they aren't speaking truth. You can tell people, look, you're going to hell if you don't believe in Jesus. That's fine. Speak truth. But how do we speak truth? Peter says, do it with gentleness and respect. Not, not, not twisting it. Not saying what isn't true. But in gentleness and respect. Gently correcting those who oppose you. That's how we receive the gospel and how we hear the gospel. Don't, don't, don't do it in a sense of, well, I'm going to make you, I'm going to prove you wrong and show you how stupid you are. If you're coming at it from that attitude, why would they want that? Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Think about Paul. And he says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, referring to Israel, is that they may be saved. Paul's been rejected by that point over and over and over again by the Jews, by his brothers. And he still has this heart. And he's like, I just want him to believe. I just want him to see. Get that heart and your response will be easy because you'll love him. So, that's what I have for you this morning. Slightly more than five minutes. But I appreciate you hanging in there. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that our church here and, and those who have attended this morning, and Father, I pray that we would be faithful ministers of your gospel. Father, I, I think of what Pete said earlier and tens of thousands of children that have received the gospel from, from shoeboxes that are going out. God, that is, that is what we're here to do. We're to do the work of the ministry. We're to do the work of evangelists, both uh, through programs and missions like Operation Christmas Child, but God, even more so, we're to do it in our in our surrounding neighborhoods, and in our community. Father, Antioch has been, has been faithful in this text to send people somewhere else. But God, they were also faithful to bring about change in the gospel in their own community. And Father, I pray that you would equip us, that you would give us the ability to go out to the people around us, whether it's family members, friends, uh, individuals who run into our community, Father, that we would present the gospel in a way that's attractive, but also in truth, Father, reckoning people and telling them that Jesus has come to save them from their sins, 
and that they can have peace with God. Father, I pray that we would be a community that does that in our community. We pray that you would just continue to grow our church in the wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Have the worship team come back up. We have one more song we'd like to share with you. Please stand and join us. I liked how Jeremy, towards the end, he said, Jesus has been the plan all along. Well, this song is about Jesus. One, two.
thanks for singing. I, we actually blew the fog out of the area. The sun's shining now, so. <laughs> uh, let's have a closing prayer. Jesus, God Almighty, you are the only one worthy of our praise. We, we love you so much and thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, who, who died on the cross for our sins. This week, help us to walk in the spirit and bear fruit. And we also pray comfort and healing for those in poor health. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord be with you today and always.